Welcome back to this I-24 News Evening Edition. This is the Daily Debate. Early this morning, at least five rockets were fired from the Gaza Strip towards the southern Israeli town of Ashkelon, with Iron Dam intercepting five of them. In response, the Israeli Air Force struck targets in the Gaza Strip. In the past, these kind of tit-for-tat confrontation have led to large-scale conflict. We will, we, uh, this scenario, will this scenario repeat itself once again and with me today in the studio is Dr. Jonathan Fine from the Ladder School of Government Diplomacy and Strategy. Good evening. Thank you very much for Good coming. Evening. And Colonel Erez Weiner, a former assistant for the Chief of General Staff of the Israeli Defense Force. Good evening. Good evening. So are we on the edge of a new war or a new uh, battle? Apparently, apparently we are. Uh, Nobody can say when, but if you see, if you look backwards and the amount of rockets that have been fired are crossing the one per day, usually you can still, you can start count the days till the next uh, circle of violence will, uh, will be uh, begin. And uh, the call is on the other side, the Hamas, if they will be strong enough to uh, maintain their uh, rule in the Gaza Strip and keep things uh, quietly as they've been in the last year, then maybe we won't have to deal with it. But it, I'm trying to understand, Iris, because um, it seems that uh, Hamas did their best uh, for the last few months to prevent any launching from the Gaza Strip. And right now, it seems that everything turned over and they're playing another game. What is the game that they're playing right now? I'm not sure that they're playing another game. They're playing the same game. The problem is that uh, the situation of the Hamas today. Hamas, till a couple of months ago, enjoyed a very uh, cooperative uh, regime in Egypt, a brother, uh, Islamic Brotherhood regime, brothers of the Hamas, and they felt better. They get flood of uh, 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 weapons through the uh, tunnels under the uh, Rafiach, and they got uh, money supply. And all that stopped after uh, the uh, change in the Egyptian regime. And the pressure today on the Hamas is, is dramatic. Iran stopped providing them money. Uh, weapons almost stopped completely to uh, pass the uh, tunnels, including other things that passed through the tunnels like uh, that, su that support the Hamas uh, leadership economy. And they're under pressure. When they're under pressure, their ability to uh, act uh, against the uh, Islamic Jihad and the other Al-Qaeda group that they have in, inside Gaza are limited, and that's the result that we see now. Dr. Fine? Uh, first of all, I think that it's important to remember that uh, today Hamas is probably in its worst political situation since its establishment in August 1988. I can say that even in the strategic situation. I'm talking about the strategic yeah. situation on the macro level. Uh, it's lost its uh, uh, natural allies in Lebanon by refusing to uh, uh, support Bashar against the Brotherhood. They lost both uh, Bashar and Iran, so the Iranian-Syrian axis is gone, which was a very important support. And then, as Colonel Wiener said, and I totally agree with, they lost uh, Morsi. So they're orphans from mother and father, and they're standing alone. And uh, uh, they have to answer their target audience and the local demands. And uh, I don't think that Hamas is interested uh, in a full-scale clash with Israel today. It's the last thing they need on their head. If you recall uh, General Sisi's uh, uh, declaration a day or two days ago saying that they're fed up with Hamas, that they want to actually take Hamas out of business, I don't think Hamas now, the last thing Hamas needs now is a clash with Israel, not to mention a clash with the Egyptians. Okay. So they're in a catch-22 situation, which is almost an unbearable situation, between the need to answer their target audience and to cope and compete with other rival organizations. The PIJ, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, basically is contracting for Iran. Uh, they wouldn't care less about what Hamas wants or doesn't want. The Salafist organizations, even more than that, and they have to keep themselves afloat in all this. Uh, I'm afraid that what we'll see, and I think this, this is what we've seen in Operation Castle and what we saw in the, uh, uh, the last operation, uh, uh, Pillar of Fire, is that things get out of hand. 
which nobody really wants them to get yeah. out of hand. But let's say if the five rockets yesterday on Ashkelon would have hit a house or killed a few Israeli citizens, all hell would have broken loose. And yeah. so I agree that this is more or less what we're we're hearing. You know, we spoke with a spokesperson uh, of uh, Hamas uh, right now uh, in our evening edition. And if I understood from the subtext of what she tried to say when I asked her, um, uh, can Hamas control actually the situation in the Gaza Strip? She said, um, except of saying that this is the Israeli occupation fault, uh, uh, she said that um, can you control 1.2 million people when they cannot get in and get out, when they can don't have uh, 1.8? Uh, they cannot get in, get out, they cannot uh, have a job, they cannot uh, uh, have the supplies that they need. So basically, Hamas cannot control the situation in the Gaza Strip. Not so sure about it. When they want to, they do that. The question of what's the price will be, what will be the political price of doing so? And I agree with Colonel Wiener that today, uh, since they're blocked from all sides and they can't deliver the basic goods, even talking about basic commodities, the, the Egyptians blew up and closed up most of the tunnels. Uh, 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 they're under pressure from our side as well. So in this case, their capability of maneuvering, or I would say their will, the political will, to deal with the other organization goes down. And no matter what they do, they, they, they won't come out. Uh, it's sort of a non-win situation for them. Um, do you think that uh, uh, it's, we just heard that it's not for the benefit for Hamas to get into uh, in a clash with Israel, but is it in the benefit for, of Israel to get into a clash with uh the Gaza Strip that's again? A very, that's a very good question because uh, on, the, on the one hand, we are a peaceful uh, seeking uh, country. Don't look for uh, wars for uh, entertainment. On the other hand, Hamas is keep building up his force daily, even as we speak right now. Just recently, we heard about new rockets that they developed to f much farther uh, uh, distance, more accurate. The numbers are bigger, and Hamas, even though that I totally agree, that is in the worst political situation that he has been from his establishment, but he still have more rockets and missiles than most of the Western armies uh, today. So we have an enemy that keeps developing his abilities, and if we have a chance and the excuse to uh, hit him when he is in a weaker point, and he doesn't have the ability to rebuild himself, and that's a very important uh, point, because after Castile operation, and even after a pillar of defense operation, all the, uh, the gains of the Israeli attack were very fast uh, blow by uh, the flu of uh, weapon and ammunition from the tunnels. But if the situation in Egypt won't change, and as we heard, Sisi has no way uh, not even a hesitation of changing his uh, attitude to, towards Hamas, and we will be able to hit the uh, uh, Hamas, and they won't be able to rebuild their forces. So maybe I want to take this from exactly this point of Egypt. Let's make it. Uh, let, why should Israel not make it Egypt's problem and let Egypt handle the whole thing? Just before that, please, I just want to add one more thing to what uh, Eris said here, and that is that if we do take out Hamas, we always have to ask ourselves from an Israeli point, who's going to take over? Who's going to take care of one? Nobody wants this burden. No, I didn't so. say take out Hamas. Yeah. Just say we can him, all right, just okay. take his abilities. Well, well, Not the regime. Okay, so what I'm saying, I think we have to take in consideration that we'd rather have a weakened Hamas or s any kind of entity there, definitely not the Salafist organization or those who are contracting with Iran, the PIJ, that will take care of the population. And so it's also, this, this dilemma is also uh, problematic. As for Egypt, uh, uh, the, there's no doubt now that uh, this is a much more convenient strategic situation than what we had during Morsi's reign. Uh, um, uh, but on the other hand, I think we should be very careful. Egypt has its own interests, its own policy. And uh, 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 as long as uh, uh, Sisi is there and uh, his attitude towards Hamas is very, very clear, uh, uh, you know, I can trust or I, I can see how the Egyptians are going to deal with this uh, in the next few months. I'm trying. If uh, I was Hamas, I would have been in a. On the verge of panic now. On the verge of panic, and I'm trying because Hamas is on a verge of panic. I'm trying to throw an idea here. You know, Israel is always saying there are parts in Israel that are always saying uh, we should reinforce uh, Abu Mazen in order to um, uh, give him and. An do a cooperation with him because we need to give him the power so he will be able to control Gaza and he will be able to uh, keep controlling the West Bank so in order that Hamas won't control it again. While I, want, I don't want to use this 
this phrase, but I'm going to use it, they're down. And maybe Israel should kick them while they're down and see the opportunity that they did, like you're seeing, saying that this is the best <clears throat> strategic uh, situation, even for Israel. But pending the force of this is exactly what will happen. The moment you start dealing with this mess, nobody can guarantee you that this will be the outcome. What happens if the Salafist al-Qaeda groups take over? What happens if the PIJ takes over? With what exactly is Abu Mazen going to take over Gaza with? I mean, this is a very, day, you're taking a very, very high risk here that things might not work according to what you want. And don't forget, we do have a bad experience since 1982 to trying to rearrange macro-level strategics. Yeah. So I think we got to be very, very, you know how it starts, you never know how that, it ends. That there were some talks that under the surface, there was a kind of, uh, let's say, collaboration or cooperation between Israel and Hamas not to, to prevent any launching from the Gaza Strip. Um, why not to take it one step forward, and I, I'm maybe too optimistic here, and try to actually sit down on the table and try to talk with Hamas? Well, first, uh, I just want to add... Uh, Especially in this weak point. Yeah. I wanted to add an, uh, something for your... Uh, for Dr. Fine. The, for Dr. Fine's uh, uh, response, we just uh, buried this week our uh, former Prime Minister Sharon, who tried to reorganize uh, regimes in the Middle East uh, and, and figure out it doesn't work the way you want. But there is other thing. Hamas today is weak in Gaza, but Abu Mazen is weak in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria, Samaria as well. The only reason that we don't have a Hamas regime in, uh, in Judea and Samaria as well or is, is the Israeli ability and forces that operate there. So trying to bring him back to, to Gaza, I don't know. When Hamas took over in 2006, they had third of the people and the weapons that the PLO government, that the Palestinian Authority government had, and they still, they still took control because they had the ideology and they're willing to, to fight for. And that goes to the to other question, the ideology. Hamas won't say it with Israel. Hamas, f from Hamas' point of view, and you, if you see the Hamas Treaty, Israel cannot exist. So they cannot sit with us. Article now, 22. But once upon a time, they were willing for a hudna. For but that's, 30 that's, years that's old something hudna. else. That's something else. Something to cooperate in order to, I need a ceasefire now because of my I'm own uh, demands. Yeah and I'm willing to give it to you, that's something else. Uh, we also, I, I don't have to remind you that we trade the uh, Gilad Shalit. Yeah. That's as, even if you use the cover of the Egyptian forces, but we still negotiate with Hamas on the numbers, on the names, on the dates and everything. And finally, we got to agreement. So when it works to their benefit, it can work. But to sit together and talk uh, with Israel about Israeli uh, uh, state, uh, livelihood, it's, it's something that uh, it's against their ideology, and their ideology. And that's, I, I totally agree with this. I think that one of the biggest misunderstandings in the West towards the comeback of religion, fundamental religious political agenda, may it be Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. In this case, we're talking about Islam. I was finishing now a book about the concept of holy war and the three monotheistic religions, and I totally agree that with the religious groups, religious conflicts are usually much longer than secular conflicts. Yes, very, very hard to, uh, to deal with. Uh, uh, Hamas, by definition, does not recognize Israel's right to exist. So there's a big difference, as Eris said, between a hudna and a peace agreement. Uh, and I, I wouldn't gamble on that at all. Hamas, by its raison d'etre, cannot accept. Israel as an independent political entity. Abu Mazen can't accept Israel as a Jewish state, so you're going to go to Ismail and Muhammad Azhar and ask them to do so. It's against their whole concept. Don't forget where they come from. They come from the same birth cradle that Al Qaeda comes from, yeah. which is the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. And there is no place for a Jewish state or a Jewish entity in the Middle East. Yeah, the question that I'm worried about is who, if Hamas is uh, toppled in uh, in the Gaza Strip. Who will come afterwards? But this is a question for the next time that we will invite you. Yeah, that's a, that's also you. the question, by the way, for Syria and Iraq. If we're watching the unfolding drama in yes. Iraq in the past week with Ramadi Fallujah and what's happening in Syria, definitely uh, it doesn't um, look very optimistic. That, <laughs> let's try to finish this weekend with a little bit more of optimism, gentlemen. Thank you very much for this. Thank you. Thank you very and much. And we're me. going out for a break, 10 minutes break, and then we will be back for the I24 News one. On one, don't go anywhere. An update from our news desk, and then we will be back.